apart from split brain patients, we have learned about functional differences between the two hemispheres from unilateral brain damage or brain damage specific to one side of the brain. Experimentally, we can induce this kind of damage for, shorts, uh, for a short amount of time. An example of this is the WADA test. Before elective surgeries for disorders such as epilepsy, this test helps to determine in which hemisphere the speech center is located. The patient is given an injection of amobarbital into the left carotid artery, which ipsilaterally goes to the same side of the brain. So the left carotid services the left hemisphere of the brain and not the right. Amobarbital produces rapid and brief anesthesia. Um, once given, the patient is quickly given tests related to language processing and memory. If the patient can't talk in the middle of the WADA test, this indicates that the language center in the brain is in the left hemisphere. If not, then it might reside in the other hemisphere, the right hemisphere. Repeated results of the WADA test have shown a strong bias for language lateralization to the left hemisphere. We've already heard um, of Broca's area already, with a famous patient having damage to the left frontal lobe, referred to as Broca's area, and this involves speech production. And Wernicke's area, which is involved in speech understanding and comprehension. These two critical language areas are almost always on the left side of the brain. Apart from language, there are structural asymmetries between the hemispheres. The longitudinal fissure, or the huge sulcus that splits the brain down the middle, isn't exactly a straight line. In this picture, we're looking at the brain from the bottom up. So imagine you're laying on the floor and someone stands over you and you're looking upward. So the left hemisphere is on the right and vice versa. So it's kind of flipped here. But the right side protrudes in the front and has more volume in the frontal regions, and the left hemisphere protrudes in the back with more volume in the posterior occipital region. The planum temporal, which sits at the center of Wernicke's area, is physically larger in 65% of subjects in the left hemisphere. So we have volume differences that track language as well. Interestingly, as a side note, children with dyslexia don't show this normal asymmetry. The volume of this area is roughly symmetrical in these children. Other studies of humans uh, with dyslexia have found similar patterns um, also within the medial temporal lobe, where these normal asymmetries are kind of reversed. So it's interesting to see that structure is really driving function of the human brain in this case. We've talked a bit now about what happens when we split the corpus callosum, but let's make sure we know what it is exactly. So the corpus callosum is made up of about 250 million axonal fibers. It's the largest white matter structure that connects the two hemispheres together. It's broken up into three parts. The most anterior is called the genu, the middle is called the body, and the posterior part is called the splenium. The corpus callosum is the major communication highway in the brain, but it could also serve an inhibitory function. The brain is made up of distinct modules and they often compete with one another. The corpus callosum may play a role in interfacing with these different modules where modules compete with one another for a spotlight in our conscious thoughts. For instance, multiple movements might be activated all geared towards a common goal of motion, so moving your arm. Later processing via the corpus callosum could help to select the most appropriate of these multiple candidates out there to combine into smooth and coordinated muscle activity. And this, um, this kind of process probably occurs the same way in other types of cognitive processing that it does in motor movements. Just as a side note as well, there are two other routes that allow interhemispheric communication other than the corpus callosum. Um, we're not going to dive too deep into those, but just know that they're called the anterior and posterior commissure. From the research, it's important to remember that the left hemisphere has specialized units dedicated to language and some forms of problem solving, and the right hemisphere has specialized modules dedicated um, specifically to spatial cognition, like visual spatial abilities, and interestingly, some forms of complex facial detection. There are other faculties that show hemispheric differences, but as a starter, these are important to know. Going into facial detection a little more, it's kind of interesting to know that the left hemisphere is really not that good at distinguishing between similar faces, 
but the right hemisphere is. The left hemisphere really only does okay when the features that can be verbalized are present um, or when these features can be tagged, such as blonde versus brown hair. So kind of related to this language aspect in the left hemisphere. Other studies that um, morphed different faces together between the patient themselves and the other people exist. So it turns out that the left hemisphere was biased towards recognizing your own face when it was morphed with others. Um, but the more dissimilar it got, the right hemisphere kind of kicked in because that has a recognition bias towards um, recognizing other people. So I'd like to also touch on a note about what researchers call the interpreter, which is our ability to make causal statements about our world and about our actions. I mean, how is it even that the hemispheres are completely isolated, leaving some abilities impoverished, but how is it that people still think that nothing is wrong at all? Most of split brain patients think they're living a normal life with no cognitive deficits. <sighs> okay. So the interpreter is kind of linked with our language system, and it resides primarily in the left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere, not knowing what the right hemisphere is doing, just tries to make sense of what's going on. An example of this is that one researcher flashed a signal to the non-talking right hemisphere to stand up, and the patient stood up. But when researchers asked the patient why he stood up, the, resp the response was pretty striking. The patient said, oh, I felt like getting a soda. If the two hemispheres were able to communicate, the patient would have correctly said that they were told to stand up. But because the left hemisphere didn't receive the instruction to stand up, it had to make a causal inference about why the body was suddenly standing up. And thus the response it came up, what, uh, came up with was they wanted to get a soda. In other examples of this, researchers experimentally showed pictures to both visual sides. A snow scene was presented to the left visual field, so the non-talking right hemisphere, and a chicken claw to the right visual field, so the, the talking left hemisphere. The patient next saw an array of pictures. Some weren't related to the previous pictures at all, and others critically were semantically associated. The patient was instructed to pick the ones that were related to what they had previously seen. The patient picked a chicken, which was correct because that was associated with the chicken claw that they saw. And they also picked a shovel, which was correctly associated with snow scenes. But now when asked why they had picked the shovel, remember that was shown to the non-talking right hemisphere, the left hemisphere struggled and had to quickly kind of come up with a causal inference. So instead of saying, I picked a shovel because it helps to shovel snow, the patient said, the shovel helps to clean out the chicken shed because that hemisphere had seen the chicken claw. So it just goes to show you how this concept of the interpreter tries to make sense of the world and is what gives split brain patients a sense that the brain is working completely fine. I'll go over one last example about hemispheric specialization. So imagine you're at a party and you quickly realize that one friend you know is not there. So you don't know a single person at this party. And this can cause some tension. Like, Do you leave? Do you stay and get a drink, try to meet some people? This is a constant tug and pull relationship between approach and avoidance or withdrawal behaviors. And as it turns out, these show hemispheric differences as well. In the prefrontal cortex of so the very front part of the brain, uh, which deals with planning and executive function, is one of the main regions associated with approach and withdrawal behaviors. So do I stay and have a drink or do I leave and go home? Interesting research has shown that the left hemisphere is specialized to deal with these approach behaviors and the right side with withdrawal. Damage to the left frontal lobe can result in severe depression, a state in which the primary symptom is withdrawal and inactivity. We expect this might be normal um, as a normal response to brain, image, brain injury, but it's actually the opposite with patients with right frontal damage. So when, when you have damage in the right hemisphere, patients here appear more manic. So damage to the right withdrawal system biases patients to be socially engaging from the intact left approach system, even when these behaviors become inappropriate. 